Uh, so last week we kind of did the first couple learning objectives. We focused on logistic regression and some of the intuition around that. Uh, this is what we have left. Um, I plan on primarily focusing on like you know, LDA, QDA. Um, well, let me get into my, I have a little learning objective here and this is, let me get this. Hopefully this is viewable and I need to get rid of this thing here. Okay, so, um, oh, this didn't show up the way I wanted it to. Um, can, well, I don't know, I don't, uh, I'll let me know if you can't see it. I know this, there's a lot of text starting out right away here, but basically learning objectives for today, I wanted to go over intuition for the base theorem, um, heuristics for when to use which classification model, like when to use LDA, when to use QDA, uh, review the charts, uh, some of the main charts, some of the charts that show up in those YouTube videos that we were just talking about, some of the main charts from, um, from, from, the, from the chapter, kind of go over those and what those mean. Um, and then adding the LDA, QDA, KNN model specs in tidy models and comparing the output. So that's what I wanna do. I also wanna start with, a, I'm happy that we're kind of talking about some of these things that came up last week because I did wanna start with a, a, a review of, of, of some of the concepts. Uh, and shout out to Ricardo for hosting the StatQuest video. I've watched a lot of StatQuest videos this week. <laughs> In fact, you might say that most of what I'm gonna be talking about has been influenced by videos uh, more than the book because I found going through formula after formula in the book a little bit challenging. But, um, and I had heard of StatQuest, but I had actually never watched a full video. So that was cool. So, um, so to start with our prelude here, uh, odds, we talked about odds last week. There was a StatQuest on odds. And in that StatQuest, um, he gives a visual of, of sort of three, like three red dots, or sorry, like five red dots and like three blue dots. And so, but the odds of my team winning a game are five to three, five out of three, which can be interpreted as if there was eight games, um, and my odds for five to three, uh, five of which my team will win and three of which my team will lose. All right, so the five is the amount that we're expecting my team to win. The three is the amount that we're expecting my team to lose. Uh, five thirds is 1.7. So the odds my team will win are 1.7. So I guess one way of putting it. And then the odds ratio uh, is in this kind of, using this example is my team winning divided by my team not winning or something happening divided by, uh, nothing happening, uh, or not that thing happening. <laughs> um, and then, so then the probability is my team winning divided by my team winning plus my team losing, right? Because we're adding mm -hmm. both things up in the denominator. Uh, so, and then there's something about odds not in your favor from zero to one. If your odds are greater than one, that's odds in your favor. So that was a little bit about odds. I did kind of look into some of the other resources such as the resource around uh, your breakpoint in your classification model. And I guess the takeaway there is there's a way to, using the probably package, there's a way to systematically um, determine your breakpoint based on whichever metric is most that you're going for. And you can actually see like a lot of different metrics and then say, okay, I, this is the metric that I care most about. This is the best, this is the best sort of break point or threshold. Uh, so I'll use that. And so that's kind of how that, that goes. Um, any follow-ups to that or other, um, other follow-ups to the uh, last week before moving on? Say this again. Any follow-ups to that or any follow other follow-ups from, from last week? I don't, I don't know. 
Just I, I, I wanted to say something about these things. The, the this one point seven mm -hmm. is like the it, uh, that um, I don't know. Like my team winning is uh, um, one uh, time that my more than one time that nearly two times my team no, is not winning. <laughs> so because if you're winning five uh, games and you're losing three you're winning more than you're yeah. losing right yeah yeah you you basically are winning twice mm, right twice, twice of the times right, nearly yeah. twice yeah because if it was six to three it would be two and so yeah. then your, your odds of winning would be two yeah which means you're winning twice twice yeah. Uh, the mouth. The, yeah. Yeah. Nearly twice. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, I think that, that that was kind of how we explained it last week. And that was sort of kind of goes along with that. Um, so, uh, generative models for classification. Um, I'm just going to skip that part there. ROC, the definition of ROC curve, the true positive rate is the sensitivity, the fraction of defaulters that are correctly identified using a given threshold. The false positive rate is specificity, the fraction of non-defaulters that we uh, classify incorrectly as defaulters using that same threshold. We'll see an ROC uh, in, in the lab. Uh, naive Bayes, classify based on the class where the probability of posterior of p of x is highest. Um, all right, so, so now let's talk about Bayes' theorem. Um, I watched, do you, are you familiar with the three blue, one brown YouTube series? Anyone? Oh yeah, they're excellent. Right, there are, and it's, it's about math, not just statistics. Uh, there's one on Bayes theorem, and so we have kind of a couple Bayes theorems here. Here's the one that he gives, which is the probability of the hypothesis. So here, the H is hypothesis. Given that, which is what this bar means, given that, the evidence. So whereas here we have the pro pro probability of the hypothesis given the evidence, over here we have the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis. So that's kind of switched around over here. And then this is the probability of the hypothesis, uh, which is the prior, and then under the probability of the evidence. This is how it's shown in the book, which is the probability uh, that y, and this is, I believe, focused, this is like the formula of Bayes for linear discriminant analysis. And so the probability of y equals k given x equals x. Um, so in other words, if we have like the default data where if one is equal to default, zero is equal to default, it's like, you know, the probability that you're defaulting based on the given observation. In the, in the data. Here, um, am I confusing? I think, I think this is the prior, and then this is the density function, and, and then this is the obvious, obviously the probability of evidence under here. So I have these defined down, down below, but basically, so we've got like kind of this maybe is a little bit more intuitive version of what is represented here. So, you know, all, all these video teachers are a lot better than me at explaining these things, but I did want to kind of go over the uh, three blue, one brown example a little bit. So he gives an example of, and this comes from research by uh, Daniel 
Kahneman and Hamo Stavirsky, uh, where there's an example where people are told, hey, you know, Steve, he's a meek and tidy stole, soul. Uh, he, there's a little bit more to the description, but it's basically like there's this person, Steve, and he's, he's a meek and tidy soul. He's helpful, but likes things organized and, you know, doesn't, isn't out in the world and different things like that. And so then the question is, is he more likely to be a farmer or is he more likely to be a librarian? I don't know if you're familiar, maybe you're familiar with this, but um, so then a lot of people say, well, I think Steve is more likely to be a librarian. And they do that because of assumptions on what librarians are like, which may or may not be true uh, and uh, in this description. Uh, the, the meek and, and tidy soul. Though you'd also assume that farmers might be, uh, you know, fit some of those characteristics as well. So, um, so then, the, so, the, so they're wrong, right? So they're, that's not true. And the reason that they're wrong is because of the, the idea of the prior. So what you have to do is you have to look, well, how many, what's the proportion of librarians to farmer in the population. And in the research, it was like 20 to one, uh, three blue, one brown guy says it's probably more than that, like 60 to one or something like that in our current economy of farmers, 60 or 20 to, to, to librarians one. So you have to do, so you have to look at that um, and say, okay, so um, let me see if I have this written here. 20 to 1 farmers to librarians in a hypothetical sample of 200 farmers to 10 librarians. Um, and let's assume that 40% of librarians fit this description and 10% of farmers. So where do we get that? Um, I think we just make that assumption. Um, fit the meek and tidy description. Thus we have, thus we have four librarians and 10 farmers in our sample with the probability of the librarian given the description equal to four divided by four plus 20 equals 16.7% approximately. So I guess going back a step, we get this, this hypothetical 20, 200 farmers to 10 librarians based on this 20 to one assumption. And so the idea is that uh, the probability of there just being a librarian in the population is one divided by 20. And so then the intuition is that because there are so many farmers compared to librarians in the population, it's more likely that Steve is a farmer. Because there's more farmers. And so even if there's four times the amount of librarians who fit this description, which is where we get the 40% versus the 10% of farmers, because of that prior, we would we would calculate that Steve is likely a librarian by 16.7 percent. Did that make sense? <laughs> any any comments? Yeah, I think I follow. I just thought that was helpful. This sort of helped me to understand some of the other formulas in the book. Here, we're back to Bayes' theorem. So here we, I guess this is the one I was kind of thinking of. So here N, this pi K, which we see up here, represents the overall or prior probability that a randomly chosen observation comes from the prior K class. So that's that. You know how many how many librarians and farmers are there in the population? That's this value. Uh, in general, estimating NK is easy if we have a random sample from the population. We simply compute the fraction of the training observations that belong to the Kth class. Again, let's say we have a random sample of the population's professions, and we compute the fraction that librarians belong, that people might belong to as a librarian or that they belong as a farmer. And this one, probability of y equals k given x equals x, this is the posterior probability. So that's over here, it's our posterior, that an observation 
uh, posterior belongs to the kth class. That is the probability that an observation belongs to the kth class given the predictor value for that observation. So, you know, 16.7% that Steve is librarian. And then this one is the complex one, denotes the density function of X. So that's up here, which is where we had, again, that compares to the probability of the evidence given the hypothesis or the likelihood, uh, as it is called. Um, and so that's what we have here, and it denotes the density function of X density function for an observation that comes from the kth class. In other words, uh, f of x, f, fk of x is relatively large if there's a high probability that an observation is in the kth class and small if it is unlikely that an observation is in the kth class. Um, right, so that's, that's that part. So that's the part that's maybe a little harder to calculate, but eventually you can get to a point where you can plug in some numbers and get a value for that. Um, all right. So linear discriminant analysis. So I have an overview again of the stat quest. And I don't know if I fully sort of connected the stat quest description from the book description in a way that made sense to me, but let me just give a very brief overview of the stat quest on LDA. He says LDA is like PCA, which I thought was interesting. So LDA is like principal component analysis. Well, what's principal component analysis? That's where you, maybe you have a bunch of dimensions. You have like 100 or let's say you have 20 dimensions or variables and you run the principal component analysis and then you have like five. And now that you only have five, it's easier to use in your, um, in your model. And how is LDA like that? I think it's because it's another thing where you're trying to limit the dimensions on the response in getting the values into, in, into the categorical classes. So he said, there's an example of like a cancer drug that works for some, but not for others. How can we classify gene expression to determine who should, who should get, get the drug? There's kind of like some visuals where it shows that you can't perfectly slice at a certain gene transcription to say all these people get the drug and then all these people shouldn't because there's like this mid middle point where there's some of each, you know, there's like, oh, there's a red, then a green, then a green, then a red. And so you can't, there's not like a perfect point of making that classification. And so um, LDA is an approach that helps to deal with that. Uh, and LDA works by both maximizing the distance between means and minimizing the variation or scatter within each category. So that all kind of makes sense independently, but I wasn't quite sure how to connect that to the book's description and formulas as well. But um, is that any comments on that? So again, I'd like that kind of made it make sense. LDA is like PCA was kind of intriguing to me. Uh, and just the challenge of how do we make that, which is probably the challenge of all classification of like, how do we make that? determination. Who gets this? Who gets that? Who, who, who has the loan? Who, who's going to buy a car and who's not? Well, we would, we would, you know, we would assume that a person with this independent variable, this input wouldn't buy a car, but here's an example where they did. Like, you know, it's, what do we do with that? So um, QDA quadratic is um, kind of simple. It's, it, you know, it gets less time in the book. Um, LDA is much uh, is much less flexible classifier than QDA and so has substantially lower variance. This can potentially lead to improved prediction performance. So here we're, we're back to one of our foundational topics in the book of bias and variance uh, and flexibility. So roughly speaking, LDA tends to be better bet than QDA if there are relatively few training observations and so reducing variance is crucial. In contrast, QDA is recommended if the training set is very large so that the variance of the classifier is not a major concern. 
or if the assumption of a common covariance matrix for the K classes is clearly untenable. So basically linear is a line, QDA is not a line. So that back to that conversation. And we'll see that visually here. That's the main things I have there. I'm just gonna just Um, before getting to the labs, so I kind of went, going pretty fast through this material here and, and I'm kind of skipping the generalized linear models, but, um, before getting to labs, I kind of want to just go through the, some of these, um, graphs. So here, this is pretty, I'll read some of the text here. So this is pretty simple. So on the left, we have a two one dimensional normal density functions are shown. So this is over here. The dashed vertical line represents the Bayes decision boundary. And right observations were drawn from each of the two classes and are shown as histograms. The Bayes decision boundary is again shown as a dashed vertical line. The solid vertical line represents the LDA decision boundary estimated from the training data. So this is, so this is, um, you know, where you see this, the classification boundary and you kind of see the distributions there. And, you know, if you're in this part of the distribution, you're, you're going to be classified over here and in this part, you'll be classified over there. Uh, this one is cool. This is where we, we talk about um, multiple dimensions, multiple independent variables. And so a lot of the same kind of conversation comes back with that as well. Um, all, all, you know, this, all I'll kind of point out with it that I thought was interesting with this one is, so two multivariate Gaussian density functions are shown with P equals two, so predictors equal two. To the left, the two predictors are uncorrelated and it has a circular base, which we can see. Um, and on the right, the two variables have a correlation of 0.7 with an elliptical base. So we kind of can visually see the correlation of the predictors by this elliptical base versus the circular. And that's all I wanna say about that. Um, then we got this one, here's kind of the multinomial, basically the idea is we've got I mean, this looks like PCA, right? Doesn't this kind of look like principal component analysis? I mean, basically we've got, or, or KNN or something. I think maybe I'm thinking of the visual for KNN. But, you know, here we've got these, let me read some of this. So example with three classes, the observations from each class are drawn from a multivariate Gaussian distribution with P equals two with a class specific mean vector and a common covariance matrix. Um, it left ellipses that contain 90% of the probability for each of these three classes are shown. The dashed lines are the Bayes decision boundaries. So that's what we see here. And then right, 20 observations were generated from each class and the corresponding LDA decision boundaries are indicated using solid black lines. The Bayes decision boundaries are once again shown as dashed lines. Overall, the LDA decision boundaries are pretty close to the Bayes decision boundaries, shown again as dashed lines. The test error rate for the Bayes and LDA classifiers are these numbers respectively. So basically this dashed line is the like theoretical, and this is like an estimated uh, from the training, the estimated differentiator here, decision boundary, which is pretty close to the theoretical there. But as you can see, you're, you're classifying based on where, where these three things fall. And so that speaks again to having the multiple predictors. I think this is the last one, or here's an ROC curve where um, I think we have sensitivity on the y axis and specificity. They seem to go in alphabetical order, S, E, and S, P. So I think if you, if you consider y first, specificity sensitivity and then specificity. Um, here in the ROC curve, this is pretty good. We wanna have, um, we wanna be up towards this corner, right? So that's pretty good. 
and then this line is basically like there's variables are are, are basically not doing anything. Uh, but this is pretty good because it goes up this way. True positive rate, which is which is the sensitivity, and then the false positive rate, which is the specificity. So as the so the true positive rate is increasing, and the false positive rate is increasing as well. But it's a pretty good curve there. Up here we have a threshold analysis. Um, they go over this in the video series. I think it's helpful to look at from right to left. So this is um, um, this is starting with a threshold of 0.5 and then decreasing that threshold. That again, of course, threshold like if you have a classification and does someone is someone going to default on their loan or not? And like the standard is like 0.5 as far as a threshold for whether they enter the default category or not. Here the threshold is going down. We see the, for the default data rate, error rates are shown as a function of the threshold value for the posterior probability that is used to perform the assignment. The black solid line displays the overall error rate. So as we're decreasing the threshold, the overall error rate is staying pretty solid and then eventually going up here after point one. Um, and then the blue dashed line represents the fraction of defaulting customers that are incorrectly classified. So that's what we see here. So as we go down, and that one maybe is helpful to look left to right. So as we go up in threshold, the error rates increase. And the orange dotted line indicates the fraction of errors among the non-defaulting customers. That's what we see here. So I guess we see kind of like the, you know, false positives and false negatives kind of have a inverse relationship. And we see that the threat difference in threshold can have um, a difference in error rate and there might be like an optimal threshold for error rate kind of a thing. Anyway, I mean, I, I didn't stop on the other visuals. This is the kind of the last one. Any, any other, any comments on this visual or any of the other ones? Maybe I'll interject one little thing. Um, I had a conversation early this morning with uh, with the group on uh, the classification threshold, and it it may be being helpful from the client to uh, to convey a, the cost of being wrong or the benefit of being right, mm. so that so that threshold can be optimized like in the performance package I guess where you started the conversation today right right but there uh, the stakeholder is able to weigh in based on like the pros and cons of each of those mm -hmm. right. and and that's where I struggle is is uh, I, I followed you know, what you've conveyed here, but I don't quite know how to dumb it down enough to say to a stakeholder, you're telling us the cost really helps us dial this threshold in, mm. right? Right. The cost of false positives or, yeah. Yeah. What's the cost to be right. wrong? Uh, that, 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 that's a very relevant comment from Jim because, for example, uh, there's a famous data set out, uh, around there about the mushrooms, uh, you know, uh, poisonous yeah. or edible. Okay, you can find it a a anywhere, you know, in classification. In XGBoost also is one of the data set that comes with the package. Uh, and the problem is, is that, okay, let's say that you're trying to classify and you get let's say, I don't know, you know, 95% uh, accuracy, right? You know, on your confusion matrix. But the problem is 
that even the one chance that you have of eating something that is poisonous, you know, it could kill you, okay? So sometimes these classifications, we have to see it like in the real, you know, in the real world scenario where how much, you know, are you willing to take a chance to make a wrong classification, okay? And for example, since I come from the pharmaceutical sector, uh, one of the things that we have to be very conscious and we have to put a lot of effort is in terms of, you know, uh, doing mistakes in the, in the process, doing mistakes that could ruin, you know, ruin the, the recipe. Okay, so sometimes you have to go a little bit overboard, just like, a, you know, just like a NASA, you know, with a rocket, for example, what is the probability of that rocket failing? Well, if it fails, you know, you, you kill all the, all the people, you know, at, at the top, you know, the shuttle or whatever. So what you do is that you put redundant systems in place so that the failure is almost impossible. Okay, impossible. And even there, you know, things happen. Okay. So you have to see it in very various scenarios in terms of what is the tolerance of making you know that kind of mistakes in those classifications, and then you kind of get a feeling, you know, in your domain knowledge, a feeling of how much you know you want to, you know, how accurate you want to be in this, you know, in in, in these graphs, okay? Uh, and and I always remember that that mushroom setting, you know, in terms of. I mean, if, if, if you were the one that ate the wrong mushroom, you're going to have a bad day, okay? So probably, uh, I, I wouldn't trust, you know, uh, iffy models, you know, like 80% or 85% accuracy because, you know, they don't guarantee that I will, you know, eat a mushroom that is, that is edible, okay? So just, you know, keep, keep, that, in, keep, that, in, keep that in mind. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, that's super relevant, right? I mean, because you want like a low threshold in medical circumstances or that's in like the, the COVID conversation is right. Is there a false test and stuff like that? Yeah. Maybe, maybe the mushroom example will work for you, Jim. <laughs> yeah, boy, Imagine you have yeah, imminent death is not one of the <laughs> outcomes in my work. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one solution is not to eat mushrooms, you know? <laughs> yeah, get it out of the diet, you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't care if it's poisonous or not, I won't eat it, that's it. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna to switch to the lab. Uh, uh, does anyone have anything else before we do that switch? No? Okay, all right, well, it's a good place to stop. So, I mean, you know, I'd encourage you to watch the co cohort one's video if you want a complete overview of all this. I did not cover it, so um, apologize for that, but you can watch that video. All right, so um, switching over to the lab, um, I just did the uh, tidy models lab and basically just reproduced it. Um, there is a nice addition to the to the to Emil's website that's not in the book in terms of taking a bunch of models and combining them and then assessing them together. So we'll see that. Here this is the same stock market data and there's this little kind of uh, I believe next week we'll learn more about um, splitting your data but here we have a kind of a simple split into a training and testing. Um, logistic regression. So here, so I so I redid the logistic regression because I needed it for for the evaluation later, where we compare all the models. Uh, and so we have uh, the logistic regression specialization here, you know, in the, the engine and mode. But this is kind of the main part we're going to look at. Obviously, this is just defining the object. We could define it whatever we want, but here we have lr underscore spec, and then we've got the fit, um, which. We start with the spec and then we put in this fit. The direction that's like the stock market up or down, that's the response. And then after this squiggly, uh, we go to our independent variables, which is the stock market information um, and the volume. And, and then the data is the stock market data from the ISLR 
data set. And so we've got the fit. So we have, I, I was kind of, I, I initially had written out like a workflow for tidy models. And I guess it's sort of inherent in what we're seeing now where you, know, you start with your data and you have to like maybe manipulate that and all, all the kind of data processing and data exploration. But then you have like a, a final sort of train, uh, modeling data frame. Uh, and then you're going to need to like split that data up in terms of split train um, test. Uh, and then um, and then you do your spec and then you do a fit. So there's so we've got data frame, we've got um, spending the data, we've got our spec, and then we've got our fit. So that's that's so fits number four here. Um, and then here's some coefficients for this fit. Uh, and then here for a linear discriminant analysis. So this is a little bit easier to explain than the theory behind it. We just bring in this code that says discriminant underscore linear. Uh, mode is classification engine is mass. I think our engine up here was GLM. So we have a different engine as well. And then the fit is the same formula. And we have our LDA, linear discriminant analysis fit. So the same steps for that. Um, I did want to read some of this text here. So one of the things to look for in the LDA output is the group means. We see that there is a slight difference between the means of the two groups. These suggest that there is a tendency for the previous two days returns, you know, stock returns, to be negative on days when the market increases and a tendency for the previous day's returns to be positive on days when the market declines. And that's what we see here. Group means when the market declines, that's this. When the market increases, that's this. And so they suggest that there's a tendency for the previous two days returns to be negative on days when the market increases, which is what we have here, and then the opposite. So that's what, so that's LDA output gives us this group means. And that I guess is, is fairly interpretable so the next thing after fit is predict. So we predict a fit on new data, in this case, the testing data. And then it gives whether it was up or down, or the stock market was up or down, a tibble 252 by, by one. So that's that, that kind of predict. Here we predict LDA fit, new data equals the testing, and then the type equals prob. And here we have the uh, probabilities. So we have that kind of more interpretability of is uh, probability of stock market going down or going up based on our model. So after we predict, we can look at performance and we can look at it with the augment and here also confusion matrix. LDA fit, new data is the testing. Then we pipe down to the confusion matrix. Truth either equals direction. So in other words, the response. Uh, and the estimate equals the dot predicted class because that's the data that we're going to have in our prediction sort of tibble. Um, and we get this confusion matrix. And that was another um, stack quest video. So we want this diagonal those numbers to be high. So these are the true values. And these are the predicted values on the rows. And so down, down means the amount of times that we predicted it, it, the um, stock market would go up and it actually did. And then the up, up is where we predicted it, it would go up and actually did. And then here we have where we predicted it would go up, but it actually went down. And then, you know, here where we predicted it would go down and it actually went up. So we want to see these, these numbers high. So we see, oh, 35 is low, which 106, we're happy with that, which is the amount of times we predicted up and it went up. 35 is low, and but we know, so we can see actually which, you know, the meaning of which one is high, you know, or low in these two. This one is what we predicted. It predicts well when it's actually up correctly, but it doesn't predict as well 
when it's actually down correctly. And then you've got your augment into your accuracy function, which gives us this, which basically I believe is the error rate. And 0.560 is um, like 56%, maybe not quite what we're looking for, but we'll see. We'll compare that with the others here. So QDA, quadratic discriminant analysis, um, same engine as LDA mass for this example, at least. I don't know. I don't, I don't really know how to speak to, you know, whether you should choose a different engine or not. Uh, but here, obviously, we have the difference here to discriminant underscore quad. That's, hey, we're going to run QDA. Uh, so everything's the same here. We have a fit. We have an augment. We have this kind of looks similar. We've got 30 for the for the upper left and 121 for the lower right. We augment it, we get an accuracy of 0.599, which is kind of in the same ballpark, maybe a little better. And, and we are seeing another increase in accuracy. However, this model rarely predicts down. This, make, uh, this makes it appear that the quadratic form assumed by QDA captures the relationship more clearly. This makes it appear that the quadratic form assumed by QDA captures the relationship more clearly because this model still rarely predicts down. I don't know if I understand that, but because we because this is pretty similar to what we saw before. 35, 106, and then so predicts down. 35 where it was predicted down and for LDA was predicted down and it was down 35 where it was predicted down um, and that wasn't the truth. So it's 35, 35 and then we look down here and it's 30, 20. So I guess that's the difference is we have less predictions of down where it's actually up and that apparently we got that from the quadratic function, but we're still not doing great. All right, naive Bayes. For this, we'll be using the naive Bayes function to create the specification and also set the use kernel argument to false. This means that we are assuming that the predictions leg one and leg two are drawn from Gaussian distributions. And anyways, we have a different engine. We have this set argument that we just heard about. And then this different function, naive underscore base for the naive base spec. Uh, I got this error message <laughs> included in there for some reason. Uh, I, need, I downloaded the package though I no longer have the error message. But we, um, we uh, yeah, we do the same things here. So here's our confusion matrix. This number is high again, which we like. This number is low again, which we don't. This low number is the same as the quadratic, which I guess is good because that's you know a wrong prediction. And we've got 0.591, so we're alas a little bit worse. But all right, so the accuracy of the naive, naive Bayes is very similar to that of the QDA model. This seems reasonable since the below scatter plot shows that there is no apparent relationship between leg one and leg two. And thus the naive Bayes assumption of independently distributed predictors is not unreasonable. Um, right, so we might not always have independently distributed predictors, but here we do. So that's, a, I guess, a key factor in whether we're using naive Bayes or not. Uh, and that's, this is the scatter plot here that they mentioned, no apparent correlation between leg one and leg two. Leg one, leg two, doesn't look like a correlation to me. <clears throat> Looks like a bunch of dots in the middle. Okay. Uh, K nearest neighbors, nearest neighbors. In this spec, you see neighbors equals three. Obviously, that's the amount of K, amount of neighbors. Uh, different engine, uh, same, same business here. So here's our confusion matrix. Here, we've got a lower number on predicted up and was up. Uh, this number is a little higher, predicted down and is down, but overall the diagonal isn't as good as 
we want. We have a 0.5 on the accuracy. So nothing's blowing it out of the water here. We've got some similar results. Here's the extra part, comparing multiple models. So first of all, we take we create this models uh, object from a list. We give this them sort of like the names of what they are in quotes, and then we equal it to the fit that we just created. And then we next, we use imap underscore dfr from the per package to apply augment to each of the models using the testing data set. Okay. And dot ID equals model creates a column named model that is added to the resulting tibble using the names of the models. So, okay, that makes sense. And so here that is, so this function models augment new data test, this thing here dot ID equals model. Um, and then here we select from this tibble we created and we see the results. Um, is this the one we want better? And then it says you can combine multiple different metrics together with the metric set. All the art stick works with group tibble. So by calling grouped underscore by model, we can calculate the metrics for each of the models in one go. So I think this is what I'm looking for. And then we have that. Okay, so this is where we have the numbers. So the um, highest estimate is on the bottom here. And so uh, looks pretty good, right? 0.858. I think we like that, right? But, but and then 0.5 in the KNN. Wait, oh, these aren't in order. This is 0.99. Wait, 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 these in order. Um, so I guess this is best. Logistic regression wins here. But the, the general idea is that you um, can compare model performance in um, in one table, which of course, with all of these, just the ease of changing the spec in the code, you can have your data. You can say, "Let me try LDA. Let me try QDA, and see what you have." Right? I mean, that's kind of the ease of this. Uh, and it creates a situation where in the same way that you might be like, I mean, I've done this for classes and not in real life. So I, I can't speak to real life situations, but like, you know, maybe you have like, you're, you're creating a model and you're like, let me try, let me try a random forest and let me try XG boost and let me try a linear model or, you know, and, and you can just sort of, sort of see what does better. Um, like here, it's kind of doing that same thing. And then this, this way of doing it, you can compare it directly on the same table, which makes it a little easier for you. And then we have our ROC curves, which don't look fantastic, maybe. I mean, we're um, logistic regret. I don't, I don't know. I mean, obviously that other, this one, this one we saw was maybe like a you know, idealized example. So may, maybe our logistic regression is okay. Or we go up, but you know, you can see we want this sort of going up towards the corner and around. And we see that based on this visual logistic regression is the best, which is the light blue here. Um, KNN is under, and that was kind of the worst. Uh, and then LDA and QDA are kind of similar. Um, I'm, I'm uh, thinking if this is mushrooms, don't eat the mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> Don't risk it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> You're going to stay away from those <laughs> with this model. <laughs> Anyone can spout their models, but you know, if you spout your model and then you eat the mushrooms, then people will trust you. So. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I guess any comments on the on any of the tidy models we can talk about. I am, I'm also kind of curious if anyone has, like would actually use something like this, or even if you would like have a logistic regression and you'd be like, hey, man, let me throw in LDA, see what, see what I got. Would you actually do that kind of thing? Well, I don't know. When, when, when you're given a deadline, right? <laughs> You've got to have something tomorrow. Um, uh, unless I've got a template with all these like pre-built, I, I 
usually just do the logistic or a, a, like a Glimnet, a regularized. Mm -hmm. uh, man, I don't know. I mean, I guess that would be the value of the this the the system of tidy models, right? Would be that ideally you'd have composable syntax for for doing that kind of thing, and it wouldn't have to take a lot of extra time, and you'd just be using a consistent format, and then you'd throw you could throw it into the different specs, and you could even you know create this output which compares them. Yeah, yeah, theoretically. Uh, Michael, uh, yeah, th this is this is a, a good start, you know. And in modeling, you have to try different models, okay? Uh, try to see which are the ones that are more fit, you know, to what your 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 problem is. But uh, you know, uh, this is all. This is the preliminary step. Uh, then you have to kind of tune tune the models, right? Because, for example, in KNN, you are just using three. So let's say if you use 10, 15, 20, you know, large numbers and see the space and see more or less if there's a, an increase in the, in the in the overall accuracy. So you have to tune the models. Then also, eventually you're going to have, let's say three models that, that they're the best. Then what you can do is stack them, okay? So you can combine the predictions of each of the models to see if we can optimize you know, besides just using one model. But but this is a, it's a good presentation and a good start of what you should be doing. Uh, one thing that I didn't uh, mention, and it's very important, you know, I just remembered this, is that for regression, linear regression, logistic, uh, KNN, LBA, etc., because they use the distance, you know, component between the mean and the, you know, and the, and the, and the true point, uh, you need to... Uh, you need to center them, okay? The scales, uh, you need to center them. Sometimes you have to normalize, etc. So that's one component that, you know, I, I know that in the book it's not mentioning because that's not the, the main focus of the book. The book is more for learning the statistic, you know, fundamentals of this. But eventually you have to incorporate that in these models because if you have different regressors with different magnitudes, that's going to affect the model too. Right. Or even you could go back to like feature engineering and how that could make an improvement in the model before you even get to the spec. So spec, choosing the spec is one choice, you know, one category of choices. Right. And, and doing some recipes in terms of, you know, uh, uh, transforming uh, certain components. Like, for example, you can transform the, the response, you know, log transform, whatever. But also in the predictors, you have to also see if the magnitudes are way too off then you have to uh, do some, some scaling uh, transformation. Right. I'm reminded of in the feature engineering book, there's a, there's a really cool visual. I don't have it queued up, but it, it like goes over, it's this uh, different colors represent different parts of the modeling process. And then you start with like exploration and then you have like different models and then you tune those models and then you repeat. And I just, I always thought that was kind of, are a really good way of visualizing it. So yeah, in the future engineering book by, by Max, uh, yeah. You, you can do main max, you can do standardize, mm -hmm. you can do normalization, you know, you know, to get between standard deviations. Yeah, ma many different, different ways. Usually the min max and the standard is one of the most, you know, used. If your data, you know, it's well behaved, of course. <laughs> That's that's great. Um, can can you scroll a bit up? The, oh, you, you, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to see the uh, just a, a, a bit up uh, the uh, the no the, the 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 snippet for making the rock curve, the ROC curve. Want to see this? Yeah, or? here this, this mm. one here. Yeah. So basically, you group by model, and he did it everything by itself with the rock uh, rock curve function. So the direction, what what was it? 
the direction is um, what upper was down. it? And the press down. Mean up or down, like the stock is up or the stock is down. Which direction is that? Okay. That's great, Michael. Thank you very much. Did you did you push it? I haven't. I need to work on that. I need to clean. <laughs> you should. <laughs> you should. You should. I, I'm sure you you, you find some um, other notes from from previous course. So you should like oh, right. put this at the bottom of the previous one. Right. I like. I did. I was kind of not sure about how to integrate it, but I, maybe it does work to just sort of like create your own page for like cohort two, um, like I did in this one. Um, and then the labs, there was nothing in the labs in the current notes. So I just included mine there. But um, yeah, I'll, I just need to clean things up a little bit, uh, name my code chunks and um, figure out how to get the functions if need be in the description. And like, I can push that, push that in. Great. So thank you very much. See you next week. Bye. Bye now.